there other ways to go into relationship to go into union that are not just one person till till you die and that's really challenging for a lot of people because we have been told the only option is monogamy and that sounds great and it is great for a lot of people but when you look at the divorce rates and you look at how much lying is happening it's like would you rather have some kind of curated custom relationship that is tailor-made for you and your partner or would you rather blindly subscribe to this model that was kind of thrust onto you when one or both of you don't want it and then you both feel like conversation isn't allowed or appropriate and then someone starts lying this is episode number 581 with candace horback and we're going to be talking today about consensual non-monogamy this is a topic we have not talked about on the podcast before in 10 years of podcasting believe it or not this has not come up and i think it's really important to explore all types of relationships here on last first date radio so welcome back i'm sandy wiener and we believe it's never too late to go on your last first date and to support you on your journey to lasting love. I've written two books. The first one is called Becoming a Woman of Value, How to Thrive in Life and Love. And one thing I noticed is that so many women and men don't really value themselves enough. And this book takes you through 30 steps, 30 exercises to really help you increase your value in many, many different ways. And the second book was written to help you make better choices in dating. This is really a guidebook. It's called Choice Points in Dating. And again, I found that so many women who I work with were making terrible choices and they didn't understand why do I keep picking the wrong people? So I take you through the entire process from how to think about dating, how to decide what kind of relationship you want, who's your best partner, how do you go about dating? How do you decide if you can still keep dating this person. How do you know it's your last first date? So both of these are available on Amazon for Kindle or paperback. And this week's tip from the Woman of Value book is step number 20, which is adapt a positive mindset, which I think Candace would agree with. (laughs) Candace's uh, mission is very similar to mine and in helping people have a better mindset. And I think that so much of the way we see the world has to do with our mindset. I have seen people who think everyone's out to get them. And so that's how they experience the world. And if you believe the world is a friendly place and things are happening for you instead of to you, you will have a better experience in life. Same same things are happening. It's just how you perceive them. So my challenge to you this week is to go ahead and turn it around if you're looking at things in a really negative way and really try to see the world as happening for you instead of to you and see what happens, see what you experience instead. Before I bring Candace on, just a quick shout out to my Facebook group. It's called Your Last First Date. And we are a group for women over 40 who are looking for a positive place to grow and learn. We have people in there who are single. We have people who are in relationships, people who have started out single and are now married. And they're still part of the group because they're still learning because so much of what I teach has to do with being a better human and not just about dating. You'll see all my podcast episodes in there. I go live every week in my group and I have seven amazing monitors who keep the group safe and sane and they post daily. This is a very highly interactive group that does not accept bad behavior as most groups do, unfortunately. So join us at your last first date. And now for my awesome guest, Candace Horback. She is a fascinating woman. She's had quite a career trajectory from a former adult entertainment performer to an entrepreneur in the production and web three space to an organizer of spiritual retreats centered on psychedelics and wellness. She's a mom to two boys, a wife, and the podcast host of a really great podcast called Chatting with Candace. Her mission is to inspire people to expand their curiosity, think independently, and not be afraid of our messiness. I love that. Welcome, Candice. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. So tell us about this career trajectory you had. It's highly unusual. I'm sure you get asked this a lot, but 
What I get is a lot of tenacity and the desire to grow and to keep expanding who you are, but I'd love to hear more about how you went from where you were to where you are today. So I guess it starts with following curiosity. And for me, that's kind of been um, like the main focal point for anything that I get into is if I'm, I genuine, genuinely want to explore it, learn more, feel like I'm supposed to be there. And part of it, I think, is just my wiring, how I came into this world. And then also it goes back to mindset and how you want to approach life. And for me, no matter what, you're going to get judged for what you do, right? You could be Mother Teresa and people still have plenty of negative things to say about her. So I think at the end of the day, you have to do things that align with who you are and what you want to discover and make those explorations to find your true self unapologetically and not for anyone else. Because at, at the end of the day, it's your life and you have to live it authentically. Um, so I was able to kind of make decisions based off of my true curiosity and not considering other people's opinions or the possible consequences for good or for worse and kind of just jumped in with both feet with a lot of things and i don't there's something really beautiful about that because i think it's the easiest way to be where you're supposed to be but then on the flip side of it it's there could be a lot of traps that you necessarily aren't prepared for because you just blindly w were following your gut or passion or whatever, whatever that looks like, instead of maybe taking a couple steps back and being like, okay, what are the good, the bad um, of all of these decisions that I'm about to make? But part of that's being young and um, you know what I mean? So that's that was the season that I was in when I got into the adult space. And then one of the beautiful things, gifts about that is I think people put you in a box once they find out that that's just the career that you were in, the decisions that you made, they try to figure you out very quickly. And usually it's with like a lot of judgment and she can go exist over there. So if you want to be able, I don't know, to play well with others you're, and you made those decisions, it's almost like you're forced to evolve. Like society forces you to upgrade your personality or your character or like your ambitions. Like you can't just stop there. And even that, I would say I'm obviously not accepted into every single circle and people still have their opinions about me. But because those opinions are so strong, it's like if I want to make my children's life easier, because it's obviously going to be hard given that past, it's like I have to, I have to do more. Like I have to constantly be growing, evolving and contributing and doing more. Um, Otherwise, it's going to be harder than it needs to be for everybody. Well, I love so much of what you just shared. And I, I want to address the fact that doing things unapolog unapologetically is so important and takes courage because everybody's always trying to put everybody in a box, even if we didn't get involved in adult entertainment. Right. It's, I mean, I remember even as a life coach, that was unconventional and it took a while to build my career up and make enough money. And everybody was telling me to quit. Everybody's telling me, go get a job where you can get healthcare, like Starbucks, go work as a barista. Like I'm following my passion and people are trying to tell me to be safe and be small. Mm -hmm. And so that is going to happen no matter what, you know, I'm you know, join like when my son didn't want to go to college, people were yelling at me, well, how could you not force your child to go to college? Well, that made them uncomfortable, mm -hmm. but I trusted that my son was going to follow his path and his passions and his dreams and not necessarily follow what everybody else wanted. So it does take courage to follow your path. And also you mentioned your children. And I think that having children really can make us so hyper aware of the messages that we're sending out to them and the role model that we want to be. And if we pay attention to that, there's, it's such a beautiful opportunity to grow as a person, to help them see what it is to have you be curious and you explore and you be brave so that they can have permission to do the same. Yeah, like we were talking earlier offline, right? More is caught than taught. So we can sit there till we're blue in the face and explain why you should be doing something or whatever lesson you're trying to instill. But if you're not walking that walk outside of that conversation, it doesn't really stick. So it's more how do you behave and what are you 
trying to um, to emulate for them. And for me, that's nonconformity, right? That's being your original self and at the expense of everyone pointing at you and saying you're wrong, right? Like there's something really powerful when you remember that you don't need mass approval. Like if just because everyone is saying something is right doesn't necessarily mean it's right. And um, you need to be able to find your character. And sometimes that's in really difficult ways, but it certainly isn't discovered with ease and, and just mass acceptance. It needs to kind of be examined. So the moments that you have um, available for growth are often going to be painful. So it's how do you teach your kids not to shy away from discomfort and pain, but actually to look at it as a tool and like a, a means of transformation and, um, and and ultimately a gift and hopefully setting that up. It's when these really hard conversations are going to happen or these really hard examples happen. It's they have the tools to be able um, to sufficiently overcome them on their own. And obviously with like help and encouragement from family, but like ultimately I want them to feel powerful and sovereign in themselves. Yeah. And I love the more is caught than taught. It's, it's like actions speak louder than words, you know, it's, but it's a great way to remember it. And it's true in the dating world as well. Like when you see somebody acting a certain way, rather than what they, what they say, who they say they are. Um, But yeah, it's, and, and things are learned with pain. You know, and you mentioned before also that you just kind of jumped into certain things without a lot of knowledge. I think that's the only way to do it. I, I honestly, it's it's been the way that I've tried everything in my life. I, I really had no expertise in anything that I ever said yes to. You know, oh, I'll write a book. I have no idea how to do that. Oh, sure. I'll lead an art program in a camp when I have absolutely zero experience doing that, but I'm going to do it anyway. And then you find out, well, yeah, I'm kind of struggling with this, but then you push yourself to learn. And I think so many people do the opposite. They they think they need another five years of education and I'm not good enough yet to do this. And so I'm not even going to try. And it's in the trying and the doing that we actually make those mistakes so we can learn. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think it's just asking yourself why, like, why are you doing the thing that you're doing? Why are you pursuing what you're pursuing? Um, And as long as those reasons aren't strictly money, right? Money and status. And it's actually something that's I don't know, like fulfilling or again, it's just sometimes I feel like things are um, they're like outside of language. You can't really explain why they happened. It's almost like this pull, this gravitational pull that sucked you in. You're like, I don't know why, but I feel like I'm supposed to be there. Like, I feel like this is a very important decision for me to make. And it's going to sound crazy, especially when it um, when it's surrounding something like porn or adult entertainment. Like, how can that be fulfilling or how can that be part of your journey? But I wholeheartedly believe I wouldn't be the person I am, have the family I have, have the life that I have, had I not gone through that. And I don't know, I feel like it was kind of me being forged in the fire. Like I just entered this gauntlet and because everything was operating at such extremes, it's it's sink or float. And I think because of that, um, I got to get down to who I really am, what I really want, and who I want to be in this world very quickly. And part of that, again, is probably how I came into this world and some of its wiring. And then a lot of it is also mindset. So I could have easily ended up on the other side of this saying, well, society doesn't accept me. Everyone is so judgmental. Everyone, like, right, it's the external locus of control. It's everyone else's fault and not my own. Instead of taking extreme accountability, I made these decisions, even though there was no way I could obviously predict the future 15 years ahead and say all of these things were going to happen, good, bad, and indifferent. Of course not. I don't have a crystal ball, but I made that decision. So I am now responsible for all of that, regardless of you know, um, it being someone else's opinion, it it doesn't matter. You know what I mean? It's like control what you can kind of control. So instead of taking a victim mentality or saying you need to do better, it's just focusing on yourself and how can I be different and how can I just exist in the world that creates doubt in these people that have opinions about me or are cruel to me or cruel to my family or whatever it is. And it's rising above it ultimately. Which is hard to do. A lot mm-hmm. of people really struggle with that. They need so much external validation. So it, it it takes a lot of character and a lot of work on yourself to not take things personally and to really ask yourself, is this true? Mm-hmm. You know, do I believe this is true? And mm-hmm. so many of us just don't even 
ask. We just think that everything the outside says must be true about us. And there could be kernels of truth in things that people say that are horrible, but it's still not okay to talk to people in really unkind ways. And there are ways to say things that, that are people can receive and give feedback in ways that are kind. Mm -hmm. But I think that whole external validation thing is such a big part of society, especially today with social media and putting whatever you put out there and people have an idea of who you are and make up stories about who you are. And it can be really disheartening. It could destroy people. So your own core is really important. And so what you said also about knowing your why is really huge. And I've said this many times on both my podcasts that your why has to be bigger than your fear, because if you know your why, you're going to be able to stay on course and not let all that other noise get in the way of accomplishing what you really want to accomplish. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's in so much parenting content too. So if you're um, looking at any kind of sleep training, like there's thousands of ways to do this. But one of the main things is regardless of what approach you take, whether it's co-sleeping or whether it's cold turkey cried out, right? Like both extremes, it's knowing your why and kind of like, um, again, providing more of like a purpose as to your decision making in that parenting versus like, what do I do? And then you end up confusing that poor baby if you're wishy-washy. So it's being able to commit to your path. Yeah. Not being wishy-washy in every part of your life. It's uh, <laughs> stay in your lane and figure it out <laughs> because especially with parenting, man, yes. you have a little crack in your system and they're going to make that a bigger crack for sure. Mm -hmm. Well, let's pivot to the topic of today because I really <laughs> want to be able, because I could talk about a million topics with you. Consensual non-monogamy, explain what it is first, and then we'll talk about the benefits, the harms, how it needs to be done, because I think this is a, such an interesting topic. It's something that I never knew anything about when I was younger. I kind of heard about it, but didn't really understand it. So tell us about it. Well, I guess to preface it, because this is probably going to be a shocking concept to a lot of listeners, and I am with you. I never would have imagined that this ever successfully worked for anyone. I would have figured that it was some kind of cope, like, oh, it's, um, and this is a, this is a common thing that gets into women's DMs that are in any kind of atypical relationship is that somehow the man has um, like duped her and like figured, you know, like manipulated her into doing something that she doesn't truly want. So I think first we need to recognize that like women are smart and capable and we have agency and we can make decisions on our own. And just because it doesn't make sense to somebody doesn't necessarily mean um, that she's being taken advantage of. Right. And this, that goes into so many things. So it's to stop infantilizing women and saying like, we can also make our own choices, sexually speaking and in relationship and all of these other things. Um, so when it comes to consensual non-monogamy, I think, even before I got into porn, um, Esther Perel is like a world-renowned relationship guru expert, and she really started to kind of normalize abnormal relationships, right? Like there are other ways to go into relationship, to go into union that are not just one person till till you die. And that's really challenging for a lot of people because we have been told the only option is monogamy. And that sounds great and it is great for a lot of people, but when you look at the divorce rates and you look at how much lying is happening, it's like, would you rather have some kind of curated custom relationship that is tailor-made for you and your partner that is all above board everything is deeply communicated and agreed upon and you are constantly revisiting it or would you rather blindly subscribe to this model that was kind of thrust onto you when one or both of you don't want it and then you both feel like conversation isn't allowed or appropriate and then someone starts lying so you have you have this variance in culture where there it's totally normal like let's say you were to go um somewhere to like the middle east and you have one man and he's got five wives and he's traveling with these five wives and let's say he brings them over to the united states and he's probably gonna get some eyes like oh my gosh there's one man with five women this is this is not okay um 
and, then, and this is actually a true story. I can't remember what country. It was one of my friend's friends, and um, he was traveling with these five women, and he was getting all of these looks. And then he goes, "If I, you don't understand, but if I was back in my country and I was traveling with one woman." They would start laughing like you only have one woman this doesn't make any sense so part of it is culture part of its religion um and then ultimately it's what do you want right like you are allowed to like put all of those things to the side and figure out what is going to leave you the most fulfilled and set up for success for 80 years with a with one person or however you want that to kind of look so i think it's just consciously stepping into whatever decision that you want and really getting down to the first principles of what that means. But if you have something, our current model, I think the United States is sixth when it comes to um, divorce rates. Like I think we're number six as far as all of them, and it's it's still around 50%. So you have something that's obviously not working. If I were to say you're gonna go outside and you're gonna go to the grocery store today, and there's a 50% chance that you are gonna get struck by a semi, are you gonna go or are you gonna wait? You're gonna wait till tomorrow. That's Those aren't awesome odds, especially when you're talking about um, how complicated it gets financially and how complicated it gets if you have children. And it just, that's a really big number. So I think no matter what, we have to say something's not working and how can we fix it? That makes sense. I think what people don't realize is we can have designer relationships. I think most of our lives, we grow up at that one mode of you grow up, you date, you get married, you stay together for 50 years Mm -hmm. or more, or you get divorced and you date a lot. But I I think that there are, there are so many variations of this actually. And people I've heard call it monogamish. That's what I say. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So uh, yeah, there was somebody that I follow on Instagram who said he is in a he's in a relationship with one person and he is open to opening it up. So communication is key for sure. Mm -hmm. I met somebody about a year ago who um, the whole relationship was kind of wacky to begin with, but it's something I never would have considered many years ago. So basically we connected on a dating app. He was, he didn't live in this area, but he was visiting his daughter who was going to college in this area. So I wanted to get together with him to talk to him because I like to get off the app as soon as possible and actually have a date. And he said, well, sorry, I can't do that because I'm heading back to my country. So he lived across the world (laughs) in another country. (laughs) And I was like, okay, but he sounded so great and he was so cute. And we had such a nice connection that I was willing to explore it overseas because he would be coming back eventually to see his daughter. We would meet. It wouldn't be like this impossible thing. And he also was a native Israeli and my daughter lives in Israel. So there were other ways that we were going to connect. So we started talking, we were having video chats and phone calls every week and getting to know each other really well. I finally met him like six months later. He's in a relationship with the mother of his child who he never married. She opened the relationship many years before. And he told me that he's now on an app for the first time and exploring. So it was the first time that I ever considered doing this. And it was, it was crazy on all fronts. I mean, he lives so far away. He was, you know, but it was, it was so much fun, just the adventure of it was really fun. And the fact that I was willing to let go of a lot of preconceived notions and be open and willing to go with the flow. Uh, It never turned into anything, but it was a great connection. I ended up spending a few days with him in a lot in Israel. He asked me to fly down when he was, he was going down there in April and I happened to be in Israel and I just, I took a leap of faith and came down. I had only met him for like four hours when he came to my area. And so we spent like a full day. He taught me how to snorkel. We just had a lot of fun and it never became sexual. It was just this beautiful friendship that started because I was open and willing to explore. And so it changed a lot of how I saw this kind of non-monogamy Um, because I knew that he actually met his partner when they came to the States. He asked me if I was okay meeting her and his daughter. And I was like, 
Yeah. Okay. Why not? Who cares? I'm just like, <laughs> I'm open to everything at this point. <laughs> um, but it just, it kind of, uh, there was, I didn't do it like, because I felt forced. I didn't do it. And it didn't make me uncomfortable. Uh, everybody who I would talk to would say, I'm worried about you. I think you're crazy. So <laughs> let's talk about the downside of consensual non-monogamy because, you know, we talk about you have to communicate openly. It has to be consensual. It has to be something that you both agree on. Mm-hmm. And um, he had told me that he had met some of his his partner's partners. Um, and, it, you know, in all fairness, she had been in a in a terrible relationship before she met him. He was her first healthy partner. And so she now felt good about herself and wanted to meet other partners and see what it was like, but she still came back home to him. So what are some of the downsides, the dangers when you have a non-monogamous relationship? Well, that's a tricky one. Um, I think we have this idea that if we put up specific guardrails and specific rules that that somehow insulates the relationship. Now all of a sudden we're protected. And if that were a hundred percent true, then you wouldn't have any infidelity. It just wouldn't happen. Like, well, we had this rule and you did it anyway. So I think this idea of like overly overbearing and control, it doesn't work. And it's, it's really, it's kind of forcing the relationship to not be its real thing. Like we're both kind of in the smoke and mirrors games and I only love you on the condition of X, Y, Z. So I would say like, don't be first, don't be under the illusion that just because the rules there that it's not going to be broken because it gets broken all the time, whether or not you realize it. Um, the downside, let's say you're in a monogamous relationship and it's really working for both of you and both of you actually are thriving in that container. And that's probably most people, I would say. It's a lot of work to be in anything other than that. It, it, like You have to know yourself on such a deep, 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 deep level for you not to take everything personal, for your abandonment issues not to come out, for your mommy and daddy issues not to come out, it, for you not to care about other people's judgment. It is a very big decision to make in our culture to do anything like that. It's just, it's not the easiest thing. It is definitely the path of most resistance. Um, So if you're in something that works and then you get bored and it goes back to asking your why, like why are you opening up the relationship? But let's say you open up the relationship for maybe not the best reasons. Like let's say you're trying to fix something with it. You know what I mean? Or I don't know, Um, whether it's you or your partner, you just don't, you don't open it for the right reasons and then one or both of you can't deal with that decision after the facts until you do it for the first time you have no idea how you're going to react and if you're going to be able to get over it so that is a huge risk to the relationship so if you already have something and it's kind of working or it's mostly working i would say like ask the why question like why would you want to open it um and i can't answer that for anyone only you can you know know your why to something that big but I would say that there are so many people that thrive in atypical relationships, even if it's only for like a season, right? And then you close it back up. Again, relationships I consider to be like living, breathing things that you're constantly revisiting and renegotiating and checking in on because I mean, anyone who's had kids knows how important that is, right? Like something that really shakes the core of a relationship is having a child with someone. And if you don't go back and revisit and say like, these are my needs now, I don't care what I said before this baby, these are my needs now for both people. Um, You're not going to be in the best position. So it's, I guess the uncertainty, right? The uncertainty of like the human element and how, how is jealousy going to show up and how is my idea of love going to show up? Like, what does love mean to me? What does marriage mean to me? Like, what does whatever, you know, definition that you want to slap onto the relationship mean to me? So again, it, it, it involves so much introspection and communication. And most people don't want to talk about bills at the end of the day or house duties. And to get into something that, that thick, I think, um, is very difficult for a lot of people. Let's take a quick break to hear from our sponsors. This episode is brought to you by Amazon Music Unlimited. You can listen to over 70 million songs and thousands of playlists and stations. Plus, you can now stream your favorite podcasts like Last First Date Radio. You can listen to any song, anytime, anywhere, on any of your devices. Get Amazon Music Unlimited for free for 30 days. Just head on over to getamazonmusic.com 
forward slash last first date to learn more and claim this offer. You mentioned a lot of things that people struggle with, abandonment and jealousy and and most people communicate terribly too. So yeah. <laughs> I think everybody would do well just to work on that. Forget about opening your marriage up at this point, like just learn how to talk to each other and express yourself honestly and openly and, and vulnerably. I mean, how few of us know how to do any of those things? Well, I heard this stat and I don't know um, if you're familiar with it or if you agree with it, but it was something like only about 30 to 35% of adults have a secure attachment style mm -hmm. and the rest of everyone has one of the insecure attachments. So I think um, even going based off of that, if your attachment style isn't solid, then like steer clear, <laughs> steer clear. Like you need a very, um, like you need a very defined border to what that relationship is before you can do anything and again that goes to working on yourself not how do i fix my partner because he also has an insecure attachment like focus on yourself and then it kind of rising tide raises all ships hopefully if that's your person um, but you don't want to like go psychoanalyzing your partner because that's the quickest way to kill all romance so work on yourself <laughs> that, that's true <laughs> yeah it's interesting with attachment styles i i have my clients take an attachment quiz when they start working with me just to see where they are. And they're like, I was shocked to see that I was secure. <laughs> and I say, you're probably secure at work and you're securely attached with your friends, but I would bet that you're not securely attached in your romantic relationships. And sometimes these quizzes don't give you that nuanced approach to attachment styles. So, and it, it you know, it's a fascinating field. It, the book attached, mm -hmm. um, the science of adult attachment, they give you a much higher rate of percentage. It's like 50% of people are securely attached. And I totally do not believe that. I think mm -hmm. most of us have insecure attachment, especially if we grew up in homes where our needs were not met, where we weren't really seen. We have no model for healthy relationships. I mean, I, I recommend books on how to even um, understand when somebody is emotionally dangerous for you because people who grew up without healthy attachment often excuse terrible behavior because they don't know what normal, so-called normal looks like or feels like. And so they keep moving the bar for acceptable behavior. And mm -hmm. yeah, anyway, that's a whole other podcast. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but I think it definitely influences how you are in these atypical relationship styles. So let's spend a few more minutes on other non-traditional or atypical relationship styles. Can you name a couple of other ways that people have created different types of relationships? So I would say um, one of the more popular ones now is poly, probably poly, polyamory, right? So you have one main partner, even maybe a spouse, a wife or a husband, um, and then you would have your paramours on the side. I know a few people that do that and there's rules with that. Um, Jamie Wheel actually, like, I don't know if he came up with this exact concoction, but there's basically like five elements and I always forget the fifth one um but you can have like a husband or a wife so a main spouse you can have a career like so something that you're super super passionate about not just you show up to your nine to five and clock in and clock out of um kids is another one extra partners and then i think the fifth one is like an active social life right it's like the scene and you can have four of those five but you can't have all five and then when it starts to fall apart is when you try to go after everything and then also if you are having other partners and this isn't just physical this is romantically involved you're spending time and all of that um it's that your additional partners can't be monogamous to you because then that ends up being chaotic as well so like they also have to be in some kind of open or poly relationship where they have a main person like you're not their main person so you can only have one main person um that's not anything i've explored or done i like that is not something i'm interested in my husband's not interested in i know it works for some people um for me like that is an expert level that i don't want to learn how to play <laughs> you know what i mean <laughs> um and then there's one that's more casual so this other couple that i know up until recently because they're trying to get pregnant um but up until then it was that they could bring women in so it was you know a married couple and 
they would bring women in and it was just physical and it was just for play. And then that was, that was kind of it. And that was the rules for their relationship. Um, other people, it's like both people are allowed to go do their own thing, but it's just physical. And then they create a whole bunch of rules around that. And again, you're allowed to revisit it. Like if something happens and you're like, I don't really like how that made me feel, or maybe like that's more challenging than I was anticipating. So let's go back 10 steps. And I think that you have to have a partner that will honor your boundaries regardless of what they are. And I think that goes whether in your monogamy, um, whether you're in a monogamous relationship or if you're anything that's atypical, it's having someone that honors your boundaries and um, allows you to revisit the rules of engagement within that relationship. Interesting. I didn't know about all the rules, but I find this whole thing fascinating. I I saw on somebody's online profile that he was a solo poly. And um, so he lived alone. I had to look all these things up because I didn't know <laughs> what half of them meant, but he lives alone, but he has, he has multiple partners. Mm-hmm. Um, so he was looking for somebody who would do that. And then there's all kinds of of abbreviations online that I, this is all new to me. There's, uh, there's married looking for basically friends with benefits, Mm -hmm. but I don't think it's consensual. Um, almost the time on online dating sites, sometimes, you know, people just say, yeah, my wife is, we don't have sex anymore. So I'm just looking for a partner. Then there are people who are, there's the whole term GGG, um, do you know about that? GGG, no. Good giving and game. Dan Savage created this term. Somebody who's basically down to do anything, I think. Mm. Um, so it's like it's like you have to encode things in your online dating profile to know what you're up for and what you're down for and what your kinks are. And you know, when I when I first started dating again and and hearing about people's kinks and it was so strange to me, even like the way people were shaving pubic hair and doing and manscaping. And it's just like (laughs) this whole new world, Um, but why not explore things? I mean, you know, the, the, the way that people generally are in the world is very much just programmed and people aren't really consciously looking at what works for me. And so even today with people who are, who are getting into relationships later in life, that they're not getting married. They're not even living together, but they are together. And in many ways that works better, like not being on top of each other all the time, having space, not sleeping in the same bed all the time that can help the relationship, you know? And I think people really need to be more conscious about what works for them and make choices. Yeah, I think we could all learn from the gay community. You know what I mean? I feel like that's one of the really great things that Dan does is he is, again, just unapologetically and shamelessly himself and just putting out his content. And he is not he is not exiling any part of his sexuality, nor do most gay men. Right. Like they just exude their sexual energy and that is their right. You know what I mean? So I think if we were to kind of approach it the way that gay men do in that way, we would have a much more fulfilling sex life, whether that was in a monogamous union marriage or any other very like variety of that but there's still so much shame even when it comes to interacting with your husband there's so many wives that don't know how to say this is what i need this is what i'd like like i don't feel like i'm warmed up enough i don't feel like i um can let go enough like i don't feel comfortable with the lights on it's like this is supposed to be your life partner and like you can't even express that level of, of vulnerability so on some level you don't feel safe and you don't feel accepted but we don't explore that or have those really deep conversations because they hurt and they're painful so we'd rather just swallow it and deal with it with the lights off and I don't really need an orgasm where I can you know I can just get one in two minutes I don't need to like fully indulge and lose myself in in sex that's that's for men anyways so um yeah I think there's a lot we could learn from from people that live in ways that we might think is a little crazy and wild and out there but I don't know I think there's all there's uh there's a lot of beauty to that yeah, I think there's beauty in letting go in general. I think in 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 owning who you are, in speaking up, and I think that's the key takeaways today are really to know yourself, to express yourself, to be willing to explore the outer edges of who you are and what you want, 
and communicate really well to the people that you're in partnership with. And uh, I, I believe it's a good, it's a good formula for every part of our lives, not just sex. Mm -hmm. And that brings me to my last question, which I ask everybody, which is what are your final words of advice for anyone who wants to go on their last first date? I would say to not be afraid to ask for what you want or to even demand what you want and not to sacrifice that authenticity for uh, an attachment or an arrangement that is built on the preface of you hiding any part that, of your authentic self. So just to like be yourself and um, don't be scared to ask for what you want. I love it. Simple and powerful. <laughs> Uh, Candice, this has just been fantastic. I, I really enjoy talking to you. You're quite intelligent. You're very articulate. You really know who you are, and that comes across very clearly. And uh, if you can share with our audience one of your links, and the rest will be in the show notes. Um, yeah. So I have my podcast. It's called Chatting with Candace, and we have a wide variety of guests and topics, and it's always something new and changing. You can go to chattingwithcandace.com or anywhere that there are podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> and you have them all listed there. So yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, really great conversations in there. I highly recommend you check it out. Check out Instagram, check out her podcast. Um, Candace is a plant of information and an inspiration. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. Thank you for having me. Thanks everybody for listening. If you love our show, please give us a high rating and review on Apple Podcasts. And as always, here's to your last first date. If you are ready to get unstuck, gain new tools, become more empowered, and finally find your last first date, I'd love to talk to you. Fill out an application to be considered for a complimentary half-hour love breakthrough session at lastfirstdate.com forward slash application. <laughs> <laughs>